So thanks everyone for joining us this afternoon um, for this next migration seminar um, of the UNU Merit and Mesomite uh, Migration Seminar Series. My name is Laura Clito. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at UNU, um, and I'm convening this seminar series on behalf of Mesomite and um, UNU Merit. Um, the Migration Seminar Series invites researchers, practitioners, and also policymakers um, to discuss their work, which relates to migration, displacement, refugees in some capacity. Um, and before I will introduce today's speaker to you, um, there's some housekeeping um, that I need to do. So our speaker's talk today will last for um, a maximum of 40 minutes, um, after which we'll have 20 minutes for discussion and questions from the audience. Um, I'd like to ask you to keep your questions until the end. So after um, Professor Lung is done um, with the presentation, you can either put the questions in the chat, then I will read them out loud for you, um, or you can raise your hand using the raise your hand function. Um, and I'll then allocate turns to you, right? You can then open up your camera if you like and your mic um, to ask the question yourself. In the meantime, please keep your microphones muted. Um, your camera can be turned on if you like. Um, but as I said, be aware that we are recording this seminar for distribution via our YouTube channel later on. Um, on the YouTube channel, you can also find recordings of our previous migration seminars. Um, but so then now let me introduce the speaker to you. Um, we're really happy that, that we're being joined by Professor Maggie Long, um, who is Professor in International Development Studies at the Department of Geography, Planning and International Development at the University of Amsterdam. Uh, her research focuses on uneven geographies of migration, mobilities and development, um, internationalization of education and labor regimes, knowledge and skill immobilities, Chinese transnationalism, investment and engagement um, with newcomers in shrinking regions in Europe, as well as activism against racialized injustice. So that's a lot. She won't be talking about it all um, today. And she published quite widely, as you can assume, on these topics in a range of geography and social science journals. She is amongst um, others, the editor um, of GeoForum and has served as a guest editor for various special issues on this wide range of topics. Um, so today um, we'll talk about um, the engagement with newcomers in shrinking regions in Europe. Um, Professor Lang will give us a talk about the objectives, the conceptual frameworks, and a preliminary finding of one of the big research projects that she is currently involved in, which is called Welcoming Spaces, which is a program funded by the Horizon 2020 scheme of the European Commission. But I'm sure she'll introduce the program uh, at length to you uh, in a few minutes from now. Um, so without further ado, I would really love to hand the floor um, to you. Um, Maggie, thank you so much again for being here um, and the floor is all yours. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Um, so I would, uh, first of all, I want to thank you very much for your invitation. Um, Laura and I, were, before we started, we were, we were talking whether, you know, of course, it, um, it's convenient to be, uh, to be presenting this online, but I actually very much like to meet you all in person. Um, but maybe we have some time for interaction later. So I will try to keep myself uh, rather brief. Uh, for sure finish uh, within 35, 40 minutes on my part, and then we can maybe talk, uh, uh, discuss a bit more. And I welcome really very much your input and your response to what I will present because um, uh, our project is still going on. I will share my screen so you have some visual uh, to go with it. Um, yeah. And then, um, I have to share this. Can we share this? Yeah, there we go. Okay, so indeed, as uh, as Laura uh, pre, uh, introduced, um, I will be talking about uh, our project. It's a big baby. Uh, it is still a baby in a way, even though it's already after midterm. Uh, welcoming space is a very big project uh, for my for my taste or for my management. Uh, let's say experience, so to say yeah, we have, um, I know that there are some horizon project with 24 partners all over the all over Europe, but uh, we have a little bit more this. Um, we are a team of uh, 10 institutional partners and I'll come to that in the next slide. But basically this, um, this project, Welcoming Spaces is um, to try to uh, merge two, you might say policy challenges, uh, you know, or, or yeah, big big issues together. One is migration, uh, and as we wrote the proposal, the call was about non-European, non-EU migrants. That was also you know in the horizon. So that's also um, what we do a lot, not exclusively in our project. And the other 
uh, policy challenge, or yeah, we might say is this uh, the revitalization of shrinking areas in the EU. So um, as always, we, we do have a project website. So what I talk about today is I really try to take you through, you know, the last uh, two, some three years uh, of our project to some years of our project and let you know some of, you know, our, our conceptualization thinking and changes along the way and where we are now and so on. So if you're interested, definitely uh, go and visit our website. As always, the website is not as updated as it should be, but there is still quite a bit of stuff and we will have more. So I will start with, of course, uh, giving you some background of our, of our project. Um, as said by Laura, it is a, uh, uh, European Commission funded project under the Ho uh, Horizon 2020 scheme. And the real name of our, or the complete name of our project is actually investing in welcoming spaces in Europe, revitalizing shrinking areas by hosting non-EU migrants. It is, a, it is a title, I mean, we are colleagues and the close colleagues. So uh, I, I'm open to also tell you that this is a title that we don't feel comfortable presenting very often because there are already some terms that we will underline. And also when we're writing the proposal, uh, but especially afterwards, as we uh, have done some field work. But I think a lot of you know, eh, when you write a proposal for the EU, there are just some terms that you have to use in order to fit the call, including the word revitalization. I'll talk about that, why we are uncomfortable about it, shrinking, uh, and also hosting. Um, so all these are terms that make us uncomfortable, but I guess sometimes when you feel uncomfortable, it's also the time when you, know, you make ways forward. Uh, the principle investigating, uh, uh, institutional partner is Utah University where I used to work and the PI is actually Professor Annelise Sommers and she said she was going to come so maybe she will, she will come in also a little bit later and here's the list of our partners as you see we have five academic partners in Italy, Spain, uh, Poland, Germany and us in the Netherlands and in these five case countries we call them um, we also have five non-academic partners so this is actually very nice because we wanted to build a proposal from early beginning on that um, that we will have um, non-academic partners. And these are mostly uh, partners who actually do work with migrants. Um, you know, like Fieri is more a, a research foundation, research uh, institute, but uh, the others actually are very much working with the migrants. So I find that very important. Um, so here today, I'm actually speaking on behalf of a huge team, even though we only have 10 partners. Uh, we also have many research part participants, obviously, people we have, we have worked with, talked to, and so on. So I would like to acknowledge them already for their, for their trust and time and uh, just um, uh, sharing the experiences with us. So um, as I also wrote on the abstract uh, earlier on, we wrote this proposal at a, at a time when we saw this call and then uh, in, in Europe, we have these two, uh, this is sort of like a paradox, you know, on the one hand at that time we were drafting the, the proposal, there were a lot of these things about migration deals, you know, like lots of money, lots of euros was, you know, being planned and given and arrange to you know these countries in you know in the in the in intermediate places to to keep basically migrants away from Europe. Mm -hmm. this migration deal so one of the biggest story was of course at that time the turkey deal and ever since then you have different kinds of deals even today you know as we talked last month there were also new deals being signed uh, with that of course there's a lot more than uh, deals with government right there's also a lot more policies and practices that are very anti-migration um, we, uh, Europe closed the border. Uh, we also criminalize people who actually support uh, uh, migrants trying to come in. Uh, um, so, you know, they're, they're that, that kind of development. And then as we are trying to, uh, well, not we, but Europe is trying to close its borders, the, the policy makers. Um, on the other hand, when we in the, I mean, geography, yeah? so sometimes when you go get coffee, then you talk to colleagues who work in rural geography and planners, and they talk about, oh, you know, these shrinking regions, a big headache, you know, how, how are we going to, you know, these places are dying, you know, um, I have a photo that the lower photo is more the, what you will imagine, right, very aged population, empty villages, uh, in Spain, they also call them the empty spaces, empty places. In some other places, we call them dying places or even dead places where there's 
there are no more young people, very old people uh, left left behind. And the photo that I have above, um, it is a German town, which uh, it doesn't really look so uh, broken or, you know, but it is a very, also a very uh, quiet place. No? So there are also uh, investments in these places already where, you know, the governments this, uh, invest, you know, sort of do face lip, do this or that, but still it is not always successful in, in you know, keeping the population there, keeping people from leaving. Um, another photo I have down there is a Chinese restaurant that I walked by in one of the uh, one of the tours that I, I made in a shrinking region on holiday. And it is very classic, you know, like very small town where you might have, you know, uh, some Chinese, a Chinese restaurant, a pizzeria, and even though sometimes they, you know, they don't survive, right? So these are the two paradox that we were we were grappling with and yeah, maybe naive, uh, we said, okay, maybe we should actually find some money to do a project. And to the main motivation is to see how we can merge these paradoxical uh, situation together. Yeah, so for welcoming spaces, we wanted to, as I said, merge this migration to the U EU and shrinking regions in the EU, these two uh, policy challenges together. And uh, what we want to see or to think about is how to open spaces to migrants, and that include refugees, but also other kinds of migrants, um, um, while simultaneously improving the well-being of EU citizens in these so-called shrinking regions. And there are many terms that we can use. Um, in the course of the project, we also find it difficult to pinpoint, you know, should we keep calling these shrinking? Uh, uh, or some colleagues say, or maybe they, we say de declining, or we say uh, descaling, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, I myself often use peripherized. Um, I find it a little, you know, less loaded. Uh, but anyway, you know what I mean. Uh, these are places that usually are very depopulated. Is is old, uh, aging, uh, going through aging, and oftentimes they are geographically or rather remote. Um, and we also want to look at this in in line with this, you know, this. Uh, SDG goals, right? These uh, we always say leaving no one behind. What does that mean if we want to operate this leaving no one behind in in these uh, merged policy fields? And uh, you know we wrote our proposal in 2019, and then uh, uh, afterwards, actually, there's quite a bit going on. Uh, I want I don't know whether you are familiar with uh, a lot of these uh, this vision that vision of the EU. So recently, in uh, there have been quite quite a bit, you know, since 2020, 21. Also COVID added some impulse that um, the European Union has actually given a lot of thought about, uh, you know, sort of envisioning the rural, the inner periphery, sometimes we call uh, in Europe um, differently. I mean, how to imagine these spaces, how to revitalize them, how to invest in them, um, uh, sort of to counter this urbanization, you know, too much urbanization kind of, uh, kind of, um, uh, trend. So if you're interested uh, about this, you can actually look up these uh, new rule packs, rule vision uh, of the EU. And that is also something that happened uh, after we started the project, definitely after we drafted a proposal. And so uh, I would also tell you a little bit how in our project we are uh, quite open to these new changes, you know, rather than saying, okay, we have a proposal, we, we will answer our questions. And uh, no matter what, uh, actually, I will show you how in the last two and a half years, so much have had, has happened uh, that relates to our re project that we have actually um, continuously, you know, uh, uh, ask new questions, modify our questions, also, you know, uh, relocate some of the resources to do things that we think actually are more urgent and important. So how do we do this? We want to find out and learn about these um, exemplary cases that already exist, you know, these kind of welcoming initiatives, welcoming spaces that already exist in the five countries that I've told you. So uh, we do social science research. So we want to gain in-depth understanding of these cases uh, and want to compare also. Uh, by comparing, I think we're thinking about not like strictly comparing, but start trying to analyze, you know, like with some uh, shared categories or concepts, um, trying to look at how they flare actually across the country. We picked the five countries, of course, for obvious reasons that they are very different, but maybe we can also through the difference learn something, um, but also within country, you know, before very quickly, we also know, you know, like big countries like Spain, like Italy, we talk about welcoming spaces, they are 
very, very diverse nature, very diverse history and so on. So we are not afraid of differences. Uh, sometimes we have too much embracing diversity. So sometimes when we want to say, say something about it, I always get uh, uh, yeah, very careful no? that we cannot really overgeneralize way too much. And I'll also get to that a little bit. But through all this in-depth uh, study of cases, um, we would like to you know, uh, analyze what kind of opportunities and challenges there are, and also to analyze the factors of success and failure of these kind of welcoming spaces and initiatives. And uh, after doing that, of course, we would like to envision future pathways. Yeah, so we do also, you know, a later part of the research already ongoing, we, we are rather future oriented, not to say solution, because I don't think there can be some ready-made one solution for these things, but um, perhaps we can share good practices, stories, you know, um, and networking itself, you know, so, so we are trying to come up with ways working with uh, the community of practices to find, uh, to identify some future uh, pathways as well. Some of the factors that we have looked at as geographers, uh, we look at all aspects, so economic, social, uh, and political, um, and also the place, no? so very much also about the environment, the land, the resources. Um, and we see these as factors that give rise to uh, the emergence of welcoming spaces, but also being affected by them. Yeah, So it is a dialectic relational uh, approach that we are adopting here. So it's not about you know, finding dependent and independent variables in that sense. Um, and then also considering the group, uh, we are a multi-country, uh, but also a multidisciplinary uh, team. So when we drafted the proposal, we also want to see how colleagues with different uh, background and expertise uh, can contribute, you know, uh, very directly in the project. So after the, you know, the planning, we decided to focus also on, uh, and actually from now on when, uh, we are in the second half of the project where uh, researchers are doing more of these uh, so-called comparison, no? as at least just the position of findings in different countries. So here we def we uh, want to focus on to look at the role of uh, history and geography uh, and positionality of these places uh, in broader systems. Yeah, so uh, so we don't look at these places as closed like a box, but uh, obviously, you know, some welcome spaces might fare better because it is position vis-a-vis -vis other places, yeah, in a certain way, why other one, you know, once welcoming spaces is not, you know, sometimes we can also uh, explain the the success and failure, the, you know, uh, the lifespan of, of these kind of welcoming initiatives this way. The second um, focus is on policy and governance. The third one is on citizens and migration and migrant engagement. So here we really look, want to look at the agent agency of the people. Uh, and the final one is a media and representation. Yeah, so as I said, no, these are uh, four sort of branches that we have identified to go deeper into. And then we are now there, actually, our more senior, the postdoc researchers are uh, doing and collecting more field data to, to get to that kind of analysis. So just quickly about our position in the theoretical debates. Um, uh, we are not, uh, we have actually, uh, after actually we started the project, you know, when we, you know, we did use terms like integration, uh, which was called uh, in the call. And after we've got the project, uh, of course we say, okay, now it is time for us to basically un undo some, of, some part of our proposal. Uh, all the people who were involved deeply in writing the proposal were, were not uh, assimilation integration kind of, uh, people, but then uh, after we've got the money, we say, okay, now we can, uh, we can start working. Um, we very much built, have uh, built on uh, Aisha Sakla's uh, idea of emplacement. Uh, many other colleagues have also, you know, propagated this kind of idea that we, uh, that we uh, support, uh, basically a much more relational and uh, sort of uh, approach. Um, but, you know, emplacement um, notion has been applied and uh, in mostly urban diverse re, uh, cases, areas in the research. So we do see that our welcoming spaces project can uh, spatially already, you know, push the push discussion further to look at and placement processes uh, in uh, more rural, you know, more peripheralized uh, spaces. How does that work out? Um, so we, you know, we are far away from these assimilation integration perspectives. 
uh, which I don't have to go into, I think, in, the, in this group. Uh, we see newcomers and the so-called locals, and here also in quotation marks, who are then the locals. Maybe they are just not so newcomers, uh, or maybe are some really almost like indigenous locals. But, you know, these places are also often dynamic. Um, but it's basically different degrees of being new, right? Um, but people, and then we see these people as actually very much a community. Uh, of course, not assuming that a community is harmonious, always have a shared goal, whatever. But we want to see these people not so much as migrant vis-a-vis -vis the locals, yeah? but see them as members of a community actively engaged in the daily place making and emplacement processes. So in that sense, we also want to contribute, no? like uh, theoretically in this so-called how to demigrantize migration studies, right? Uh, how to actually see, uh, not, or not to sort of isolate migrant as a particular uh, analytical category. And so there are many geographers in the group, and I know that nowadays these, you know, that with the spatial turn, a lot of our colleagues who are officially not geographers are also very much interested in thinking about places and spaces uh, as open, uh, as positioned in broader systems, not as a box, not as only as a territory, you know, with a fixed boundary. So we very much are looking at how places are always in the making um, and we pay attention also to the translocal linkages, uh, the flows. And then we're trying to map out also if there are any, you know, uh, so spatially and temporally um, uh, sort of unbound our, you know, our, our, uh, our scope, how to see whether changes can take place in, you know, more chain reaction sort of when something changed and what comes after us, uh, and also corridor of changes. These are some uh, notions that um, I have worked with Annalise and who's from Western in Utrecht uh, with the UU group for a long while, you know, to think about development chains and corridors. So how to, how to see, you know, how spatially and temporally you know, uh, changes take place and has is sort of dynamics, you know, that uh, spatially and temporally fans out uh, um, in time and in place. So what we want to do in the in this project is use and develop the idea of emplacement and uh, to see how we can see that uh, emplacement as process that go beyond place, one place, but actually spatially more unbound. Um, how, how, you know, people and place in a transnational, translocal uh, kind of manner. Yeah, these are all, you know, things that colleagues, lots of colleagues have been actually uh, talking and, and discussing. So, so we see ourselves definitely as, you know, part of this community. Um, and uh, about, I, as I said to you earlier, that there are terms that, um, that you know, uh, they are, they are conceptual notions that uh, we sometimes find uncomfortable with. And those are also places where we would like to engage in you know, future uh, theor theoretical discussion, right? For example, this idea of shrinking uh, or revitalizing, you know, because revitalization seems very much like a, a growth oriented. Hi, Leti. Hi. Can you please turn off your, cam uh, your microphone? Yeah, thanks. Leti is one of our uh, colleagues in the welcoming spaces. She wants to make a statement that I'm here. <laughs> but anyway, about revitalization, right? We sometimes still use the term, but uh, we definitely use the term that uh, not as a sense that we are pro-growth and uh, unquestioningly, you know, because as we get in, go into the community, we, we actually also talk to people as they say, you know, okay, you know, like it is not about revitalizing meaning always more investment more money and therefore we are fine yeah also uh, there are a lot of transformations going on right right now with the climate change and all, and all, many things going on so um not that we are that we are doing too much with degrowth for example as a concept uh, but we do hear here you know on the ground how people how communities actually think about um uh, revitalization you know in their very contextual kind of contextualized way as well so we don't want to come across and saying that oh you know we have a problem with shrinking and therefore growth must come uh, so just just to put it on the powerpoint so that um, you don't uh, you understand where we are coming from that we are actually very much interested in seeing how uh, communities see their futures with migrant or maybe without migrant right this is also part of the research I told you already that our research uh, approach is quite open in the sense that um, uh, we have taken on changes um, uh, along the way. We have to, like the COVID-19 pandemic, basically, you know, we are a COVID baby, the whole Welcoming Spaces project. 
uh, basically the week um, when we kick off the project was the time when COVID uh, arrived in Europe. So we have a lot of online meetings. Um, that's one thing. Um, our researchers had to do quite a bit of online research. Uh, it's possible, sometimes not possible. So, you know, in, in some teams, there were also some delays, also because there are uh, COVID regulations were not the same across the five countries. Also, some colleagues were able to do more work than the others. Um, but we also decided to take this on, not only as a contextual challenge, um, but also to take that on because it does affect the, the real, real time field that we are studying. So for example, on the right hand side, you also see that we have uh, some um, blogs, blog like uh, 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 reports that we put on, that we wrote quite early on in the project um, to report what's, what was happening during the pandemic to EU, non-EU migrants in shrinking areas. So those are, uh, you can find on, on our website. Um, and also the field that we're studying also changing because of COVID, right? Um, as we were now back in the field, then we say, yeah, you know, the rural areas become sexier than before. In Italy, we were hearing that, you know, young people now they want to go back because, oh, you know, actually we could work digitally. So actually there's a lot in the Netherlands also, right? We're also seeing that, you know, people are very interested in, you know, buying houses and moving to the more rural part. Um, so, you know, what does that mean in, you know, in our field, right? The shrinking region as a field. So actually there is no choice, I think, if we want to be relevant, we have to also modify, you know, our research question, our lens as we go. Another big thing that happened in the last uh, period was of course the war in Ukraine. And we talk about, of course, Ukraine, they are European migrants, but then that's what I was saying, right? We wrote a proposal to talk about non-EU migrants, but it would be ridiculous, I think, and we then say, okay, then that is just outside of our school, we don't look at it. Um, not only because, I mean, we are not full-fledged looking at uh, migrants from Ukraine in all countries, but we do keep an eye uh, open. Um, in, uh, for example, very interesting in Poland, no? when we first have Poland as a partner on our project, we, our assumption was that, oh yeah, you know, the Western European countries, they have more experiences within, uh, you know, having welcoming spaces and practices. Uh, even our Polish colleagues would say, oh, you know, we don't have welcoming spaces in Poland. We are, you know, until then it was, Poland was, you know, rather uh, unfriendly, you know, to, to migrants. Um, but with the with the war in Ukraine, suddenly the whole Poland became a welcoming space, and then it toppled. It was actually very interesting, and also uh, reminded us that hey, we also have to see, you know, what does that mean? Not only because suddenly Poland has a different role in this welcoming spaces landscape, also because the way how oh, I see some typo on the PowerPoint. Sorry, um, how. Uh, a migrant from Ukraine or refugees from Ukraine are treated quite differently from the EU, um, pol uh, EU politics, right? How they are able to move to places as they would like. They are not distributed and stuck in places, which are the, which is the way how refugees from, you know, from other places have been treated. Um, Ukrainian uh, migrants can start working immediately when they're here. So for us, it's almost like an experiment is yeah we can imagine you know it is like a real reality imagination right that that indeed um you know migrant so called reception can be can be done differently uh, and what would that be uh, so we find it actually very very intriguing um and therefore yeah indeed no here also this big change uh, has also modified our uh, our our research uh, somewhat uh, yeah so Go, go to some preliminary findings. As I said to you, we are uh, a bit a, a bit after half time, and uh, in work package language, we are uh, we are finished with work more or less finished with work package one, and then we have a bunch of second you know sort of second stage work packages that are still going to be uh, finished. Um, so work package one was about this um, scanning basically huh? in these five countries where can we find welcoming spaces or initiatives? And uh, we have about 50 at the end. It's, uh, of course, it's not an exclusive list, but um, our colleagues actually really looked, you know, and then we made a pretty big database uh, of, you know, a lot of data and, you know, what kind of places they are, um, uh, what kind of nature, you know, uh, when was it emerged and so on and so forth. So we do have this kind of data and um, and right now, what is being finalized, indeed, are, are the five country reports, and they are more uh, 
qualitative and more fresh out, you know, kind of report of uh, of these spaces. We don't do all uh, 49 locations at, or, you know, because 49 there are then also more. Some of these are places with multiple initiatives and so on. So in the five reports, we have um, deeper, basically, uh, um, uh, discussion, you know, on uh, exemplary, I would still say an exemplary, uh, yeah, range of welcoming spaces. Uh, some of these are more like place, like a, a, a village. Some are initiatives, you know, so they're also different. Um, and uh, what I can say in a, in briefly here is that we do have huge diversity uh, across and within each of these uh, case countries. Um, they are very different. The, these welcoming initiatives and places are very different in their context. Um, and these are the factors I, I talked about. Um, and because these places are very different, they give rise, they make, you know, to a variety of welcoming or not in, initiative and spaces. And also different in, in scales, you know, some are very local and some are more network. Um, so, you know, again, uh, uh, we, we see a lot of differences. Um, and then these, of course, in turn have diverse impact on the place and on the people. Um, of you know of the cases that we have uh, we have studied, um, but what we have seen uh, are important factors, you know, uh, which are not really surprising, I think, to you. Uh, you know, the economic conditions, you know, whether they're jobs, infrastructure, the social, you know, factors that can contribute to social well-being, you know, whether they're as housing, education, uh, health, um, uh, service, you know, and how these communities are. Um, the politics and politics, very important. You know, so whether, you know, there is certain uh, stability or uh, there are places with hostility or turn to become hostile, you know, so these are factors that also determine, right, whether uh, these welcoming spaces can flourish or actually, you know, uh, have to then, you know, move. I mean, one of the cases that we didn't study is Riace, right, some of you might know in Italy, where, you know, it was once a very welcoming space and, you know, there are you know, right-wing politics and then made it um, not viable anymore. Um, we do see quite a bit of importance of the geography as in, in many ways, but also from the resource point of view, for example, what, what kind of uh, uh, land-based resource, you know, like whether uh, agriculture is possible or tourism is possible. Um, and right now, a lot of, any, a lot of investment in these so-called shrinking regions have related to energy transition, right? So whether there's space for that, there's sun for that, you know, whether there is wind for that, you know, those, those are the, also part of the geography that we're talking about. Location is also very important. So uh, for instance, distance from the next town, you know, or the distance from the next uh, welcoming spaces, you know, all these have uh, an impact. Uh, and across the five countries, you can already imagine, you know, the Netherlands, we have very different geography, very different size and distance and infrastructure. Uh, compared to, let's say, in Spain, right, where you really have places that is uh, very far away, you know, that it takes a long time to travel, where uh, transport infrastructure is not uh, so convenient. Yeah, so all these, of course, uh, uh, make a difference. Um, so I'm very sorry if, if you expect that, you know, like a, well, one clear formulation or a formula, you know, what makes a good welcoming space is very, very difficult. Um, uh, or it's not possible to to you know, uh, to conclude, unless we accept that we can say you know these array of factors are very important. Um, I don't have time, of course, today. I keep looking at my watch. That you know that uh, I only have five more minutes or so. But what I want to flash to you is just some a taste, right, of some of these uh, cases that we have found that's quite very interesting. We found that also uh, uh, allows us to you know to. Uh, more conceptually think of you know some of the some of the notions that we are working with um, for example this case from Italy in Camini it is a co-op uh, that was set up and same story right like many others right it is a place where there is a lot of our migration it's been uh, so-called abandoned for years a lot of old people very few young people so what happened is that they um, opened a reception center for asylum seekers in 2011 and these reception projects uh, include a lot of things, it's very holistic, right? It includes the uh, sort of more ecologically reconstructed houses. Uh, it, you know, sort of re 
work with the cultural heritage it organized workshops um, and then you know has a restaurant and then it also involved in tourism uh, production of organic oil and you know involved that kind of economic activities which um, create jobs um, so uh, and it also has quite a few of these sort of attention paid to you know gender e uh, ecology and, and so on so all in all our colleagues in Italy at least um, uh, consider this as one of the uh, a very good example you know how uh, from a very abandoned depopulated areas you know a decline area because they opened the door then you actually uh, come in new knowledge skills investment and so on you know uh, and you know a lot of in Italy a lot of the things that we have found have a lot to do with these you no know, sort of um, uh, organic agriculture plus some tourism um, um, and and that you know at least before COVID, it was, you know, it generates some, uh, some more mobility and uh, also vitality in these places. Um, this particular case in, in Spain is interesting. Um, Leti is here, but I will, call, I, will, I will just tell the story quickly. But it is a place where um, uh, my colleagues told me that it's very special because um, the community uh, accepts mobility as something that is okay. Yeah, um, it is not a failure when people don't stay because this is also part of it, right? Okay, we have welcoming spaces, but these people come and then go again, you know, and define that as a failure. Um, but then I find this one very eye-opening when when my Span colleagues from Spain say that look, but this is not this way, right? They have a lot of people who stay medium term. They stay for a few years. They might be actually foreigners or not. No? There are also Spanish people coming just from elsewhere, but they come with children, they live there, and so they keep the school moving, they keep the social amenity going, but people don't stay forever, and it's not considered as a failure because people move on to something. So what is important is that mobility keeps coming. So you have new people coming to keep the this structure going on. Yeah, but I find this particular very, very um, powerful also for us to think about, you know, how mobility as a solution is not about immigration and stay there forever. Uh, of course, good people stay, but it's also okay when people don't stay. So how can we invest actually our energy, our, you know, innovativeness in thinking about how to keep system moving so that new people keep coming, finding this place interesting. Yeah, so we indeed actually can see mobility as a solution, if we want to say this way. Um, the last and third one that I want to show is from the Netherlands. Some of you might know of this um, experiment also. It's funded by the EU. Uh, it, was a, it was a scheme between 2017 to 2020, I think extended to 2021, called uh, Talk. So it is about training and employment uh, trajectory for refugees who um, uh, get trained in the care sector. Uh, what's interesting, this one, I think is also, not, again, quite classic. Uh, as you got, as you asked me, now, Laura, to speak about something about migration and demographic changes. And of course, you know, aging, lack of care in the el you know, elderly care sector is a big thing here in our part of Europe. Um, and therefore, this is quite classic. Right? Oh, let the refugees learn, and then they can, you know, sort of fill our gap in the, in the, um, uh, in the labor market uh, gap, you know. Um, we can discuss whether you know whether you know sort of ethically or more morally this is a, something good to do but at least it is a scheme uh, where we find yeah positive resonance also from the people being trained and the people who get you know uh who, the employers and also people who get care for uh but what i want to put this slide on today is actually to think about borders because um uh, we tend to think of these five countries as separate as five cases but at the same time, we also want to see, especially here, Netherlands, Belgium, uh, Germany, you know, a lot of things also happen, you know, around the border. So, um, so again, no, uh, we need to take space and place in, in serious consideration to consider, right, like how mobility can work out, uh, what does it mean by you know, the border and and um, so, you know, this is just to be quick. Huh? This is that's why I, I put it down, not necessary because it's so innovative. It's actually not innovative at all uh, to say, you know, we train refugees uh, to fill our labor gap. Um, but it's interesting to think about this cross border cooperation, you know, in, in the EU framework. Um, yeah, so what, what have we actually, uh, uh, what insights? I think some of the things that we really 
have found and also really want to do is to unsettle, unsettle further uh, assumptions, right, um, about welcoming and well-being. If we say well-being is like a better life or better prospect, but it is about for, by, and with whom. I think that's important. Not because when we started, we sort of say, okay, welcoming spaces welcome the migrant. But as we actually learn, we realize that actually the residents, longer term residents, newcomers, they actually co-create new welcoming spaces because they are migrant coming in, actually places become more welcoming then also for the local become more welcoming, you know? So how do we see these as much more co-creative um, uh, rather than, uh, you know, sort of being, host, host, you know, being very generous and, you know, open uh, welcoming spaces for, for the newcomers only. Yeah, so we highlight very much the role of the newcomers in these kind of welcoming practice practices. Um, we see uh, these places as much more spatially unbound. And this is some of the things that we want to look into more, uh, how these welcoming, spaces you know sort of open up uh, nurture new trans local and transnational links um, and the temporality is also very important as we're saying you know uh, the not staying forever you know keep moving and maybe you know sort of more cyclical uh, short term all these can also be you know something that we can imagine to be solutions if you want to call them this way so in, in doing so, we hope to be able to renew and unsettle some of these conventional thinking about, you know, about welcoming, reception, social integration, uh, shrinking, revitalization, so on. Um, I think one more minute just to uh, go to this, the, uh, the remaining task that um, uh, uh, we still have a, a bit of time. And right now, uh, and already go ongoing is that uh, we are looking across, as I said, not looking across the five country cases and try to analyze the role of all these things that I told you before. But the blue points are some of the, st are some of the things that uh, we have always had in mind uh, or not. But these are the things that we actually identify now that you know we want to pay more attention to. Uh, we didn't expect anything from Ukraine, but we do think that it's important to think about the implication of migration from Ukraine. Uh, not so much to study there, the Ukrainian experience per se, but how to understand um, how Ukrainians are being welcomed or managed as food for thought you know, for non-EU migration. Uh, we want to look much more on translocal links because until now we're looking in, into the spaces mostly. So how do we, you know, we indeed do the more uh, open, spatially open kind of research. Um, we want to also take a more serious look in, uh, into the darker sides of, of, uh, of the, you know, of the issue. We, we don't actually talk too much about the anti-migration part of it, the resistance, the racism, the violence part of it. Um, probably because we are already looking for welcoming spaces, you know. So what about, you know, to contextualize this, right? So I think we also find it important uh, to also confront, you know, um, and there is enough going on that uh, that actually a lot of these so-called shrinking regions are also being taken you know, by, by very conservative um, uh, uh, groups and, and people. So what does that mean to our research? Um, and then to demigrantize our, our lens, we also uh, plan to uh, take a more careful look at the effects and potential of policy interventions, investment plans, et cetera, and these sort of rural vision uh, era, you know, that the EU now says a lot of these things. Uh, different governments are also trying to revitalize the rural areas, uh, also because of COVID, you know, where more and more people think, oh, we can actually live in the rural area. What, is, what would that mean, you know, to these places? And then what would that mean to maybe migrant? You know? um, and last but not least, we have been uh, always very action oriented. So we will continue uh, engaging with our uh, colleagues, um, especially also through our non-academic colleagues. Uh, we have different communities of practices. So that's something that uh, we definitely will continue uh, working. I think I will stop. I've talked a lot already. Um, I would love to I get your questions and comments. And uh, I know that some of my colleagues are here, so we can also do this like a, a share discussion. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Maggie. This was really a, a fascinating presentation, not only on the um, the welcoming spaces as such, but also a little bit on the, the politics involved in doing such a big, you know, <laughs> a big project with all the concepts and then how you start thinking about them. It's really, really fascinating. I'm uh, I'm sure that there's plenty of questions uh, from the audience. 
Um, either, as I said, raise your hand or put it in the chat and then I'll read it out loud for you. Um, so Melissa, do you want to go ahead? <laughs> Yeah, thanks. Sorry if you hear, hear children in the background. So um, really interesting project. And I know this my my question that I'm going to ask is not exactly the the point of the project, but I'm still wondering um, if you noticed any differences between spaces or, for example, um, is there something specifically characteristic about these spaces that also make them more welcoming than let's say other periphery spaces that might not be as welcoming? I don't know if you've looked into this at all, but I think it's really interesting to understand what are some key characteristics that kind of make a place more welcoming. Yeah, um, yeah, Melissa, indeed, this is a very core part of our project, right? That we, we go into these welcoming spaces and try to understand um, through these factors that I told you about, right, the, the economic, the political, and the social, and of course the, the place itself, um, um, and, and try to come up with, you know, an analyzing, no? Of course, each of these places also have its very specific and very contingent uh, path, you know, sort of path that lead it to the success or, you know, or failure or only short success. So it is very difficult to, um, to conclude, uh, but definitely, you know, policy governance, uh, there should be, you know, uh, jobs or potential uh, where where migrants can, you know, can flourish and contribute, uh, you know, their, their capital, you no, know, may it be money or knowledge or whatever. Um, we also find relative location very important. No? So how close is these place spaces close to, you know, uh, if, if it doesn't have its own job or, you know, uh, then who, who can, where, where can people go to? You know? So there is some of these classic, right? It's not surprising. People need job, people need housing, uh, children need school. Um, so uh, so we do find the factors that we have identified, yes, yeah. I mean, we do find uh, evidence you know, that those are important. Um, uh, yeah, of course, also, you know, political atmosphere also important. Um, but as said, um, uh, we, we, our approach was already to find these welcoming spaces to study them. So uh, in that sense, you know, when coming up, we do also want to uh, think a little bit more critically, you know, like, uh, you know, what about the other spaces? You know, what are they missing? No, exactly. what, why they have too much, you know, that, that exactly. don't make them welcoming. Yeah, yeah. yeah, and that was, I think, a little bit more my question as to did you, when you guys were like selecting the, the areas that you were going to look at, because of course you from the beginning now selected areas that are more welcoming to understand what's going on there. But in your selection process, you know, what were some of the major differences or if you could say something about that between like places you decided not to look at and those that you decided to look at as in, for, for yeah. example, yeah, no, go, go ahead. Yeah, I think, you know, we, we indeed, because I think of the, the main motivation, the, the we wanted to actually show, we wanted to pick out these welcoming spaces, these practices as, um, you know, that's under the radar. So you're right that we were actually looking and trying to really map them out. And then the, 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 even the first scan that we did was about you know, these welcoming. I mean, some of them have different uh, for, uh, history, right? Some of them actually you know, don't last very long or you know, so being welcoming once doesn't mean that they can survive forever. So there's still plenty of diversity to study why some of these welcoming spaces, you know, and then we also study, you know, is it the role of the government more, the role of the NGO? You see in Germany, for example, is, things are very different, you know, the role of the, of the government, for example, is very different compared to in Italy, you know? Um, uh, so in that sense, you are right. We didn't do like a, how to say a completely systematic, you know, sort of scan of, you know, the whole place and then uh, to see how come the other places are not, uh, you know, there's no emergence of welcoming places or initiatives. So, so in that sense, yeah, but the, these are some of the things that are in the back of our mind, you know, like to always relativize, you know, what we are seeing. Obviously, you know, it is a selection of spaces that we're seeing, but still, I think there is a, quite a bit, you know, that we, uh, in this project that we can, uh, we can uh, look further, you know. Great, thank you. Thanks, Thanks. both. <laughs> Are there any other questions or comments? <laughs> I have a few myself. I mean, maybe in the meantime, please feel free to post your, your comments in the chat. But in the meantime, Maggie, I was super, super fascinated by a lot of things that you said. And it also made me draw lots of connections to literatures that I'm a bit more familiar with. 
Mm. Um, and uh, this is maybe a phase in the project that you're not necessarily already at. Um, but I was really curious, for example, to hear about um, any sort of relationships that you see between this concept of emplacement, right, and this concept of homing or homemaking, which I which I have noticed is also some sort of an upcoming thing, right, in migration literature. Um, and the same, I guess, for the vast literature that is out there on, let's say, sanctuary cities, right, or in least welcoming spaces, specifically in urban geographies, right, especially in the US, obviously, but also increasingly, um, there's research being done in Europe um, mm. on this. Mm. So did you, are you trying to, or are you attempting to speak to these literatures as well? And what do you think that your project adds? I mean, can you maybe elaborate a bit? Yeah, now I'm really speaking on behalf of a big team. Um, um, and uh, we, uh, I see Annalise also here. So if she wants to also chip in to, uh, we, we have a big team of quite uh, multidisciplinary background. So indeed, um, also seeing how the young colleagues you know that in their dissertation, how they actually uh, uh, have worked with, you know, um, the research quite differently. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's very beautiful. That to see, you know, colleagues with different background, they are, you know, they are speaking to different bodies of uh, of work. So we don't really, you know, I mean, we do have emplacement because we we just want to make sure that we don't go these sort of integration and assimilations um, direction. Mm -hmm. uh, we have some of these that I told you about. These are core stones, right? Uh, cornerstones of our project that you know we 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 don't see migrant as passive, you know, and, mm -hmm. and so on. Um, but beyond that, uh, as a project. Um, yeah, we are open for colleagues you know, to to speak to different uh, from homing to uh, to belonging, you know, and to other things uh, or other concepts that uh, they find they find useful and appropriate. Um, but for us, I think uh, what we want to really engage is is this um, uh, emplacement. We find it very useful because uh, it is about this, uh, you know, co-creative. Uh, um, you know, dynamics and how we can also see emplacement as something transnational and translocal. Mm -hmm. I think those are, you know, the, my last slide, mm -hmm. are some of the things that you know, at least a few of us who are, you know, more in the middle, you know, trying sort of keeping the project, so to say, together, huh? because of course, every country we have teams and they are working with their junior scholars uh, on their way as well. So there are these, some of the things that, um, yeah, and, and I guess we also think about impact, huh? like uh, how, how to, so if we spend time thinking through these concepts and making connections, then what are, uh, what can be the impact, right? Mm -hmm. so, um, so I think that's, that's also shape our, our energy flow a little bit, you know, like where to invest our energy uh, in engaging which body of academic and policy debate so that you know, actually, um, we can make a difference. Um, yeah, it's a long, it's a long answer, but I think it's still to be seen. No, like what mm -hmm. uh, colleagues are going to, but I totally see the connection. Of course, no, I mm -hmm. mean, uh, as you say, right, like this kind of welcoming sanctuary city, where uh, city of refuge. You know, there are a lot going on, and uh, we are definitely in, co in conversation with those uh, colleagues, and some of them are working with us. You know, like mm -hmm. their PhD in these projects, working with us now as postdoc. So we're definitely seeing, you know, a nice community building. Yeah, nice. Yeah. Any other questions or comments in the meantime? <laughs> Otherwise, I still have a question on temporality because I think halfway through your, your presentation, I indeed wrote down, what about time and temporality, right? What about yeah. the intersection of time and space? And then you came with this example, right? Of the, of the Spanish case and it really sort of, yeah, mesmerized me a little bit um, because I immediately also wrote down what about temporary residency status, for example, yeah. right? Of people coming, yeah. how does yeah. that impact indeed the way they are feeling yeah. welcomed? Yeah. But then you you gave this really nice example, right, about how yeah, it's yeah. not necessarily about stuckness, right, in a particular place. Yeah, but I have to say, of course, that also uh, I didn't talk about power, you know, and mm -hmm. privilege so much. No, I mean, and all rights, right, mm -hmm. because. Uh, to be able to do that mobile come in and out of course you you also need rights right to do so and and um and when you're talking about the temporariness of people actually for example don't have a visa to stay um it's a completely different story then yeah so so i you know we don't have a lot of time to go into this but of course you know temporality is also very politicized 
feel, no? just like speciality, right? Like now when we talk about the Ukrainians, okay, they can go, you know, they, you know, so they do they end up in shrinking regions? So that is also our, our question now, right? Mm. Now we also have a researcher now starting to, okay, when people are allowed to move freely, you know, through their network, do they then end up also in places where, yeah, they might, you know, have more space, mm. but a little bit peripheralized? Mm. Or are every, is everybody now in the city, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, so if that is the case, then maybe then we say, okay, these all these allocation policies just is of course really it would not would not you know would not be successful because people don't want to live there. Yeah. So uh, so it's the same. The temporality is the same. You know, I don't want to romanticize. You know, this uh, uh, temporary and cyclical movement. If people are forced to do so, then you know it is uh, definitely problematic. Mm -hmm. uh, but I find that particular case very, yeah, very inspiring, no? like also to uh, more to say, you know, how to judge success and failure, right? because in a proposal, we say, yeah, we go and study success and failure of these welcoming spaces. But then when you go into the field and you realize how do you actually define success and failure, you know, um, and can opportunity be actually constraints for others? You know, so a lot of these things are very relational. So once we have to operationalize the research question, then we, we find that we are, we need to ask further questions, you know? mm -hmm. but I guess that's our life. Huh? So yeah. we'll do another project, maybe. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but yeah, these are some of the things that I think a lot about, also you know, in general as a geographer. Mm -hmm. You know how uh, place, space, time, uh, how that you know, uh, unfolds. You know. Yeah. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Any final comments or questions? <laughs> Otherwise, I would really like to thank you, Maggie, for- um, Can I ask you? actually the community here, are they mostly PhDs or, or colleagues in your group? Yeah. Um, I think for about one third are either PhDs or postdocs or, or colleagues in, yeah. uh, at UNU. And then okay. um, a good share, uh, I guess, is uh, you know why they're interested. I okay. hear that we also had someone from the ministry here today uh -huh. um, who was interested in following the talk. Um, yeah. But yeah, it differs a bit. Yeah, yeah, great. Maybe one day we'll see each other in a in you're another very, setting. You're very welcome to uh, to join us. Or you will come to Amsterdam. Or okay. we come to Amsterdam. <laughs> no, thank You'll you so much. You'll get some Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank you, you so very much. much. Yes. Thank you so much for being here. Um, mm. Everyone who is interested in rewatching this recording, you can do so um, via our YouTube channel, I guess in a week from now or so. Um, and in the meantime, thanks so much. Take a look at the website uh, to see all the interesting uh, reports that you already wrote and uh, that you will write in the future. Um, yes. So, um, yeah, thanks. Have a good day, everyone. And I uh, would love to uh, see you indeed in Maastricht or in Amsterdam again, Maggie. <laughs> yes, yes. Take care, everybody. Bye bye. <laughs> Take care. Bye. Thanks, Laura. Yeah, no, thank you. I uh, I noticed that I uh, kept the recording on, which was not what I uh, what I meant well, to do. We can uh, still cut that. I can so cut I can it. See. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can cut it. Okay. Yeah. yeah thank you. Um, yeah. No. Thank you. Me I, the time. Sometimes it's nice to even talk about it. You know, because you are so much it, working, working, and then I yeah. found it super interesting. Really. Yeah. But I remember um, hesitating whether or not to apply for a position in the project back in the back in the days. Okay, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, what are you busy with these days? Or oh, maybe you should turn off the recording. Yeah, I'll turn that off. Indeed. Very brief uh, chat.